Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the 2021 Spring uh, Rice Digital Humanities Showcase. I hope that this becomes a frequent event. I'm Lisa Spiro. I'm the Executive Director of Digital Scholarship Services in Fondren Library. Uh, and I've been kicking around the digital humanities com uh, community for longer than I care to admit. Um, back when it was called Humanities com uh, Computing, uh, I, I got started in this field. But I'm really pleased uh, to have uh, four projects presenting their work today, um, showcasing some of the most exciting work at the intersection of uh, humanities and computing. Um, so each speaker or each project team will have about 10 minutes to share their work. Uh, we plan to hold questions until the end in, in the hopes of uh, stimulating a lively discussion and uh, we'll end around one o'clock. Um, so let's get started. Uh, with Dr. Ann Chow, who is, um, among other things, the program manager of the Houston Asian American Archive, or HA, who will be presenting on Network of Words. Uh, so take it away, Ann. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for joining this talk. I'm going to share screen and start our conversation. This project is part of a paper that's going to be published in the uh, Histor Journal of Historical Network Research's special edition on China. Um, I'm actually one of four people in this team. I'm the historian who poses historical question and then does the interpretation. Um, the other three names you see on the screen, Jia Yang is a graduate student, Zhan Dong is a professor at the Baylor Neurology Institute who does network analysis of genes and protein, and Chi Wei Li was a PhD from Rice in statistics. He's now teaching UT Dallas. So they do the computing, the actual methodological research, and I do the historical research. Um, so a little background, I'm a modern Chinese historian who studies the transition from the Qing Dynasty, which ended in 1911, to the Republic, and then the first 20, 30 years in this very messy Republic period, when China finally took a turn to communism. And these pictures are derived from the uh, very um, humiliating situation in 19 a late 19th century where China engaged in a series of very unwise wars, uh, lost every single one of them, paid huge amount of indemnity and silver to all of the foreign countries, um, US, Japan, Britain, Russia, France, Germany, you name it, and basically depleted their imperial treasury. Um, these caricatures tell you how many countries are carving up China. And then so people, the mandarins in court were pretty much in denial. They didn't believe that the West was more powerful than China, and they basically uh, silenced all these more forward-thinking mandarins, but not the intellectuals. So this young man, Liang Qitao, is a prodigy. That's all I can say he was. Um, he began in classical studies and very soon um, found a mentor who was also chafing at changing the Chinese cultural system. So they got about 10,000 scholars who were in the capital trying to take these final exams that will lend them official status and position and wealth to petition the young emperor to change China. Um, this, this was phenomenal, it's unheard of. Uh, the young emperor, to his credit, believed China was falling apart and really listened to Liang and his professor, his advisor. And in the summer of 1898, basically took apart the system, uh, wanted to get rid of the sinecure, get rid of bureaucracy, get rid of um, the final exam system, and wanted to change everything. His aunt, who was the regent, Empress Sushi, was greatly alarmed at this process and basically put um, the emperor in jail and eventually poisoned him to death. And then Liang had a price on his head and escaped to Japan. Uh, in Japan, he published this fabulous magazine called New People's Miscellany, where he talked about Copernicus, about Montesquieu, Rousseau, um, John S. Mills, all the, and he studied the financial system of the West, and he really wrote all about this and told the Chinese people, wake up, this is what the world's coming to. He even went to per Paris to attend the Treaty of Versailles negotiation. Um, you may not know, but World War I ended with a treaty negotiated in Paris. The Chinese had high hopes that Woodrow Wilson would agree with China to take by the land that was occupied by Germany, the losing country, and return it to China. 
Unbeknownst to them, the Chinese government had already promised Japan the same piece of land in return for money so that the Chinese government, uh, the different governments in China at the time could engage, could buy weapons and engage in, um, in civil war. So this was a total disillusionment for him, but eventually he came back to China, became finance minister, justice minister, uh, director of finance bureau, and then eventually ended his political career in disgust and retired. This young man, six years younger than Liang, um, read Liang's uh, New People's Miscellany and was fired up about how we can change China. But he had an extremely radical uh, bent of mind. He went to Japan and got in with the social Democrats, the Japanese socialists, and he started telling people, we can't reform. We cannot afford to reform. Let's throw out the Qing dynasty. Let's just have a new government. His magazine, La Jeunesse, or uh, New Youth, uh, really fired up the young generation of high school students and university students in 1915, 1919, resulting in this May 4th demonstration. So the news from Paris came back after the Treaty of Versailles that the US government could not help China to gain peace, to gain back that piece of land from Germany to China, and instead had given it to Japan, the students erupted in uh, marching down the streets in Beijing, and students in Shanghai, merchants, laborers, all joined in a gigantic protest called the May 4th Movement. Um, from there, uh, when Chen also wrote in his um, a journal about Montesquieu, about democracy. Uh, they love Ibsen's play on the doll's house and talked about what would happen when Nora walks out of the house. Um, but he's decided the Western democratic system is not helping us. And the time at that time, the Russian the Bolsheviks came calling to China saying, we will renounce all of the treaties that the Tsar made with China, we will help you. And that led Chen and his friend to a turn to a Marxism, socialism, and eventually he founded the Chinese Communist Party. But then in 1929, he became, uh, he was kicked out of the party, became, he became a Trotskyist. So this is the background that I needed to uh, explain what we're doing. Um, because these two men were probably some of the most influential intellectuals at the turn of the century and had decisive role in throwing China from a imperialistic Republican path to communism, I wanted to know how different or how similar were their languages and their writing. So in the methodological section, we first curated lecture, the, the literature we called 491 articles from Chen and 391 articles from Liang Qitao. And then we did, we had them digitized or we found the digitized version online. We created a system where we found the co-occurs network, how many words came together. And then we did a graph theory um, application to find clusters of words that came together. Um, and then I did interpretation. So then what is a co-occurs network? It's, let's say we have 120, 125 articles. If the word governance and the word liberty together occurred in the same article, a hundred times, then that is a co-occurrence network. Um, and this is an interpretation that my colleagues were able to do better than I could. Um, and then after we called those co-occurrence words, then we applied a, a graph theory application to find the pairs of words that came together. And then this is how we uh, found what was together, what words and what phrases went together for them. The glitch in the system is that unlike English, Chinese words are individual characters. So we cannot just rely on R or something to produce the words that are most often occurring. For instance, these six characters, we read from the left or right. Um, in this one phrase, it means a soldier of the United Nations. However, if you just use the first two words on the left, it means united. You use, um, you take another group, it means United Nations. And if you add another two, uh, these two words alone mean part of the nation. And then this is of, doesn't mean anything by itself. And then these are soldiers. So in order to avoid a lot of noise and uh, meaningless co-occurrence words, we basically had to choose. So I was the one who made the decision to choose these 30 terms to find co-occurrences and a network graph <laughs> graphs. And these are all the words I felt had a lot to do with nation building, which was a topic that was of utmost concern to both of them. So um, very quickly, I don't know how much more time I have. These are the findings. So in Liang Qitao's first period, when he was in China, he was just beginning to prepare people to understand what is a modern nation? What does a national uh, a citizen mean? So we can see clusters of words that went around the word people, economy, 
And here we have a cluster of words that centered around governance, national assembly, and another cluster that went around people's power, limit to power. And this is a beginning introductory, if you want to say 101, political science, how to be a member of a modern nation. Okay. In his second period, he was in Japan in exile with a price on his head uh, by the Shishi Emperor. He met all kinds of Japanese intellectuals. He also went to the US to travel. In his travels, he actually met JP Morgan. He went to see President Roosevelt um, and decided the guy was an imperialist. It wasn't possible to talk to him about Chinese uh, self-determination. Um, and then uh, he, he just absorbed everything he could. And you can see how complicated the networks were. Um, so there are three words with high between the centrality and high degree centrality, constitutionalism, liberty, and people. Um, and, and then once we uh, find these results, I'm the one who does the interpretation. And I will say the interpretation for lack of time, but I have pages and pages on that. In the third period, um, it was a devastating time. As we mentioned, in 1919, the Treaty of Versailles came down, total devastation on um, expectation that the West would help them. He also had visited Chinatown in the US and felt that the Chinese in Chinatown were more educated than Chinese in the China for democracy, and yet they made a mess of Chinatown. His conclusion, democracy was not for China, not even constitutional democracy, actually monarchy was better because the Chinese people were too ignorant to be able to control their own uh, politics. And this is the time when he was, poli he was in the government. He was, as I mentioned, Minister of Justice, Director of the Monetary Bureau, Minister of Finance. Um, in the end, by 1920, he quit politics in disgust and it ended his life writing about philology and history. So this is Chen Dushou, the founder of the Chinese Communist Party. In his very first period, he was a newspaper publisher. He went to Japan as a radical Chinese student. He came back, published this influential new youth magazine and fired up the imagination of the high school students and college kids. So in his writing, he uses much simpler Chinese than Liang Qichao. Uh, he gave, we can see these are not connected clusters. They're just separate thoughts, but also again, dealing with people, liberty, democracy, national assembly, finance, constitutional rule. Now, the second period, he became the Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party. You can very quickly see changes in his thoughts and the way he clustered words together. Here, proletariat becomes a huge concern. Revolution, of course, social revolution, socialism, capitalism, evolution, because to him, I'm sorry, did I just go back? To him, um, Marxism is basically an evolutionary stage in the kind of system that countries should use to govern themselves. Um, in the third period, his last period that we studied, he was kicked out of his own party because he became a convert to Trotskyism. Um, Stalin's directives to the Communist International, which basically funded the Chinese Communist Party, were extremely disastrous for the Chinese. Chen Tuchou spoke up against them, and yet he was he was uh, silenced by the Comintern agents. Trotsky, who was engaged in a power struggle with Stalin in Russia, criticized Stalin and said, you, shouldn't, you should not have done X, Y, Z in China. And Chen Dushou jumped saying, this is exactly what I'm talking about. For that, he was, liable, he was labeled a traitor in the Chinese Communist Party, kicked out of his own party, and he became, and he was also jailed by the nationalist government by Chiang Kai-shek. So when he finally got out of jail, he was, he was approached by Mao Zedong, who at that time has risen to power. And Mao said, if you retracted your, uh, if you confess your mistakes, you can come back to the party. Chiang Kai-shek's uh, ministers were all Chen Dushou's friends when they were in um, university together said, Chiang Kai-shek would like you to come and be his advisor. To both answers, Chen Dushou said, I did not make a mistake with my policy in the Communist Party. I'm never coming back to the Communist Party. Chiang Kai-shek, actually, his soldiers had killed both of Chen Tuxiu's sons. So Chen said, Chiang has blood, my son's blood on his hand, I will never join them. He died a pariah, but in his last writings, he reflected on the situation in the world and that Stalinism is not um, communist ideology. So Stalinism, Stalinism is, and as communism is not the way to go. Democracy is not the way for China. Someday there should be a socialist democracy that would be the best system for the government. So this is, um, these are the findings. And the last graph I want to show is when we did a global network of words, we can see that 
Liang Qixiao had so much richer a vocabulary than Chen Zhishou. The red lines are the co-occurrence pairs that both authors had in common. But we can see that Chen Zhishou repeatedly used the same words in a rhetorical device to drive home a point, whereas Liang Qixiao, who actually was better read and had more exposure to Western literature, had a lot more complex ideas. And so that ends my, comp my presentation. Thanks so much for your fascinating talk, Anne. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Perez Eldada, who will be talking about data at the intersection of time and space, the Spatial Studies Lab at Rice. And currently, he is the director of the Humanities Research Center, professor of humanities, and involved in a, a number of spatial humanities projects. So take it away. Hello, thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. I presume you are seeing a psychedelic uh, screen. Hold on. Yes. All right. So this should be there. OK, so I hope everyone is in good health. Um, what I'd like to, to do today is present a capability we currently have on campus in the area of, of data visualization uh, and in the form of the Spatial Studies Lab. So this capability and this lab consists in essence of a group of scholars, GIS specialists, designers, and developers with whom uh, uh, who are working on all these projects. And they're all, all, everyone is working together to build online geospatial platforms in one form or another. We basically combine vector, raster, and other forms of data at the intersection of time and space in order to create web experiences and hopefully insights as well. In terms of how we work, we basically take raw data, gather it, curate it, standardize it, catalog it, and then analyze it. Then we give this data form by synchronizing, formatting, and stylizing it. Only then we can code the project by developing it and finally deploying it. And that method seems to work for just about all of our projects. These are the fields where our projects can be pertinent, historical research, community engagement, urban development, disaster recovery, uh, health and environmental analysis, and finally, even digital tourism. So here are a few of our ongoing collaborators, the technologies we use, and the research clusters under which our projects have tended to coalesce over time. And these are Space Time, the Houston Project, Le Van Carta, Public Health, and the Glacel map project. I'm not going to describe them all. We don't have time, but I will show you a few snippets here and there. The space-time cluster can best be illustrated by the Imagine Rio project that Alida Metcalf and I got going years ago, and thanks to which this adventure in, in data visualization began. And I'm going to show you a quick animation. Should it? Yep, here we go. So it's essentially a diachronic map of a city over its entire history. In the case of Rio, it begins around 1560. Um, and then we, we basically planned out the entire evolution, every street, every street name, every building, every building uh, annex that we can put our hands on. Um, and it goes all the way to the present. And uh, when it ends, it ends into a, a satellite image uh, the most recent satellite image of a particular city, in this case, Rio. Integrated in this platform are raster data, so images um, that we locate in time and in space as well. So for every one of these images, there's a cone of vision. Uh, we also, in terms of raster, we also have uh, historic maps, also located in time and in space the transparency of which can change in order to verify where we got our information from. And then finally, in terms of rasters, um, uh, architectural plans or urban design plans, master plans mostly. Um, that, and then one can also go check out the document where it is in greater detail with its associated metadata and at much higher resolution. Uh, there's also um, 
there's obviously a map legend where one can uh, filter things by type. Like, let's say you want to see all the parks of Rio in 1903. Um, you can also search by polygon, meaning you draw a, a rectangle and it gives you back everything you, you fished out of the map. And then if you click on it, it will take you there. Uh, we also have plans that the municipality did for Rio, um, in, in this case in 1903, uh, and then the city will technically grow into this plan. Okay. So uh, we also built the same kind of map uh, for the campus as well as for Houston, uh, or at least I should say for all of, for now, Harris County. Uh, and together, plus a few more uh, Houston-centered projects, um, they all add up to this, the Houston project cluster. Um, think of an imagined Rio type project that focus on a particular site, in this case, our own campus, uh, and that also works on your phone. So I will go quickly, but basically you can travel through the history of the campus on your phone. Um, see what you might have seen had you been back in 1910. Um, had, if you stand at a particular spot in campus, you can sort of look at your phone, see the view and compare the two. Um, oops. And so that was the campus map. Here's the Houston map. I know we only have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna rush a bit through these things. Um, so this is the entire the entire history of Houston, beginning in 1836, and the, these are the the rectangle they are the city limits back then, and then these uh, obviously Houston is a city that keeps on growing uh, in terms of city limits, um, and it works very much like the the imaginary map I showed you a bit earlier. I'm going to. Oh, no, wait, I want to show you something else, sorry. So where, what we also did with the Houston map that doesn't exist in the, uh, the, in the Rio map is that we added layers for social vulnerability. So things that the CDC produces in terms of social vulnerability, um, we can uh, ingest into the map itself, I would. So the geographic data we have tends to be down to the year, but for the Houston map, um, we are also working on ingesting data down to the day so that we can go to a particular year and show what happened between such and such a day. And for example, I'm gonna take you back to August 27, 2017. Oops, here we go. And if you remember, this is what happens over the next five days. Oh, for at least for Harris County. And then suddenly, boom. <clears throat> so in order to map out all the buildings of Houston, we have far more than in, in Rio. Um, uh, we are relying on old insurance maps um, that are fed into a deep learning model which allows us to literally harvest building footprints. Uh, basically, the computer recognizes colors and shapes and gives us back uh, vector data that we can then upload into the platform. So we don't have to actually draw every one of these buildings that may have once existed but no longer exist. But, but we certainly have its date and can extract its footprint. So when the pandemic started, we had the idea of using our skills and technologies to create and deliver interactive dashboards that visualize the evolution of SARS-CoV-19 in various cities, states, and countries. So in other words, um, the company Esri made available these dashboards. You probably all remember the one by John Hopkins. Um, and uh, we decided to do one for Brazil. Um, which we did by state and by city. It went a bit viral, um, like 2 million people looked at it over the first two weeks. Um, and actually was used on, was displayed in 
the COVID-19 Crisis Management and Command Center of Brazil's Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation and Communication. Um, not that they asked our opinion, we could have added a zero and ruined their day, but we did not. Even the governor of Sao Paulo uses our dashboard as a meaningful backdrop um, or background for his social media videos. Um, and we then turned our attention to Houston and showed hotspots by zip codes, um, to which we also added layers that showed the CDC social vulnerability indices in order to compare COVID-19 and other forms of social uh, vulnerability. Uh, it actually reveals that the greater number of infections are happening or were happening in the suburbs, at least back then. Uh, here's another for the state of Texas. Anyway, these, these COVID uh, dashboards opened up the possibility for us to visualize diverse forms of data sets in collaboration with groups at the Baker Institute who are working on health related issues in Houston. So we began with urban history, digital humanities and ended up doing public health uh, just because we could and just because the pandemic uh, had sort of this urgent dimension to it. Um, so we collected, so for example, at the Baker Institute, Bill Martin and Katie Neal Harris have collected um, data on, um, on fatal drug overdoses and drug possession charges. Uh, here, I'll show you. Um, so we basically took their data and mapped it out. I'm gonna go quickly, so. so. Um, the same applies to data collected by the Child Health Policy Center for Health and Biosciences Group, which, so we took that spreadsheet and turned it into this. Um, uh, that we which basically examines the pattern of childcare centers closing and opening over time during the pandemic. So which part of town they could afford to close, which one, which part of town they could not afford to close. So finally, when I got involved in all this seven or so years ago, I did not anticipate that I'd somehow be in the business of harvesting data and making it visually and publicly accessible especially around disaster recovery. But I would like to end by showing you this last project that illustrates how the web can serve to produce useful tools in fairly rapid time. Here we go. So if you remember back in August 4, the Beirut explosion, um, we wanted to create a platform that showed the extents of the damage very quickly. Um, so that uh, when the Red Cross created zones for NGOs to work in, people on the ground could, could quickly see what, uh, what their zones um, uh, are, are going through or the level of damage in their own zone. So we harvested images that were uploaded to the web. Um, and all this was done in basically in a week um, uh, so that we could literally create a tool that could show someone on the ground the extent of the damage very quickly in another words, very large uh, situation. Um, so we, we found this, uh, so basically there are platforms online that have open APIs. We could use them, download the images and cross reference them with building footprints. So we did that with photographs. Um, <clears throat> so all these yellow dots, each one of them is a photograph, but also we could now filter by degrees of damage um, we could filter, and this is uh, by comparing satellite photos before and after. Um, we could also show which buildings were classified as heritage buildings and which were not. Um, which, which buildings were built before a particular date, uh, which had to do with the seismic uh, building codes, so earthquake building codes, so to see whether if it's a building before then, it probably took a bigger hit than if it's a building that was built after 2000. Um, uh, what else? So, and then everything is probable. You can click on the building and find out the name of it, the parcel number, and so forth. And some of these photographs online are 360. Um, so the earlier uh, survey we did was, was interpretive. This is actual and 
So people started giving us their, um, their surveys of building damage. So those were actual assessments of damage, not, not interpretive assessments that we had done uh, at the beginning. Um, so it gets more technical. <clears throat> And uh, I mentioned how at the beginning we compared two photographs, here they are. Uh, and basically the pixel disturbance gives you a degree of damage um, that we can then compare and then associate with building footprints. So finally, we built a 3D model of the city um, that could then be connected with videos that were online on YouTube and on Twitter videos of the actual explosion and videos of the aftermath um, so that the, the 3D model could become a kind of could become a kind of avatar for the video. If you click on the building here, I'll, I'll let you listen. Um, if you click on the building, you will know what's in the video. And, and finally, uh, the aftermath. I will stop here. Thanks so much, uh, Ferris, for sharing that exciting work. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis, who is the CV star transnational China fellow at the Baker Institute and associate director of the Chow Center. Um, along with Brandon Zhang, who is a research associate at the Baker Institute. And they will be telling us about China Urban Outdoor Propaganda Archive, uh, 1998 through 2019. So take it away. All right, let's see if we got it here. All right, can we see okay? Yep. Yes. yes. Hi, so I'm Steve Lewis uh, with the Baker Institute and in Asian Studies and my colleague Brandon Zeng and I are going to present on our, our Urban Outdoor Propaganda Archive, which began with research I did back in 1998 when I was walking through local districts in Shanghai and Beijing, and I noticed there was big variation in the outdoor political propaganda or PSAs, and uh, I wrote a, some research showing that there were central propaganda campaigns, but local governments interpreted them in a way that they found most useful for their economy. And I decided to try and walk back over the same streets in these districts in Beijing and Shanghai every five years. And so I did that up to 2013 and Brandon Zeng here uh, did it in 2019. And then we're going through translating, transcribing uh, and putting them into an archive. And uh, the goal is to have something, a, a nice tool for training students of political communication and Chinese politics. Uh, I'll be using it in my class sometime next year and we're almost done. And so hopefully in a year or so, this will be a, a really nice public resource. And so I'll let my colleague, uh, Brandon Sung, take it, take it over from here. All right, thanks, Steve. All right, so just as a quick introduction, um, oh. Yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so just as a quick introduction to uh, the study and the data that we took. So for the most part, we, um, took public service, pictures of public service advertisements, and we tried to stick to the same streets in the same districts in Beijing and Shanghai every five years between 1998 and 2019. So we tried to like uh, see how the specific ads on each given street changed uh, every five years or so. Um, so we uh, figured out things like changes in themes and designs, as well as the actual messaging. And you know, we also recorded data as to which districts and which uh, which districts as well as which streets and which year um, so that those can all be prepared. So uh, for some of the initial data, we have about 3,200 entries over 20 years. So an entry being, you know, a specific ad, sometimes some PSAs, you might need two or more pictures, especially for the larger ones. Uh, but we have around 650 unique ads from 98 and around 400 or so. You can see in 2013, it's a slightly lower number. We think that might be because this was right after Xi Jinping rose to power. And so a lot of districts might have held back a bit, not sure what to do with those ads. Uh, another little bit of uh, interesting here from the beginning is that there were six districts in the area that was covered in Beijing 
and five in Shanghai in 1998, we were trying to do mostly the city center, so the central districts. And by 2019, both central areas of the cities in both areas, like there were only around four districts each after murders. So uh, just to go really quickly over some of the uh, complications you might uh, foresee in actually creating an archive out of the raw data, right? So how to make the transcriber's life easier. Uh, one particular example would be commercial ads that look like PSAs. So uh, I'm just mentioning this because we did try to foresee certain things that would make things more complicated, but sometimes you won't run into them until you actually start coding. So this one um, happened increasingly after you get to the early 2000s. Uh, it was pretty simple to you know, fix that. We just removed it from the collection. And let me just show you what I mean when I say a commercial ad that looks like a PSA. So for example, here you can see, you know, there's a lot of red in the background. So it's a very common color in um, public ads in China. And you can see a traditional motif, the kids dancing there. And you can also see that it's not apparently obvious what the advertisement is for, but Xiang Chu Bagua is in fact a restaurant and so not a PSA, right? Commercial ad. A uh, slightly more complicated issue would be the Beijing Olympics. So Sometimes you see certain advertisements that aren't particularly related to the Olympics. They're just using it for marketing purposes. So we determined pretty quickly, this one does not belong into the archive. We took that out, but this one does. So this one does include official branding, but it is actually a, a real PSA. You know, it's the Olympics, there's corporate sponsorship. So that in itself, you know, <clears throat> did not necessarily make it not a PSA, so to speak. So a few of the things that we have discovered so far. So as far as design goes, right, the ads do get more sophisticated as you get closer to the present. Um, so if you see here in 1998, Beijing, um, a few examples of ads from that. So about the environment and littering in um, Shanghai, you see somewhere as like, um, you can see like the actual message is not terribly different between ads. I just showed you these as some examples of the graphic design from then. So when they do have graphic design, it tends to be more like the photos. Uh, contrast that with 2019, you see a lot more, you know, um, computer generated designs, a lot more sophisticated. Um, you get to the point actually where even trash cans uh, tend to include more designs and uh, um, logos, for example, on the left there. It's not just recyclable waste, it's also recyclable waste for civil civility. So, you know. Um, verbosity, yeah, this one uh, was particularly noticeable as you uh, transcribe messages on the ads, but in 2019, there is a bigger trend towards uh, more expository text. And oftentimes it's an, a party approved uh, uh, explanation or slogan. So as an example here, you can see the main message is the Chinese dream, right? In the center there. And in fact, for this one, there were two pieces of small block uh, fine print and the one just before below the and to the left of the main slogan was actually too blurry to transcribe. So the bit below in italics, that's actually from the top right underneath that diagram of China you see over there. Um, so you can kind of see it, it, it very much is a party approved, party written, you know, explanation of Chinese dream. Um, another example here, this is uh, from a series on core social values. So this is only one of 12, but you can see it's not just focus on civility, which is the two characters there, right, Vin Ming, but um, they also have small text that um, sort of explains a little bit further the meaning of civility in this context. And I should also mention this particular piece of text I found multiple times, copied and pasted multiple times. So when I say expository text, they oftentimes are uh, not always, but oftentimes are copied and pasted somewhat. So another major uh, finding we found, this is a particular motif that has become more common. Um, the core socialist values. So these have become increasingly common under Xi Jinping, although they were actually um, formulated in 2012 before he formally came into power, but um, to an extent 2013, but definitely a lot more in 2019, you see these on a lot more posters and there are, not always the main message, they're oftentimes just added in. Um, and so you can see here, for example, um, the poster itself is about the Chinese dream. Um, and, you know, it features design that kind of goes along with the message of the Chinese dream being like an art scroll. But you can see at the top over here, um, you know, above the main messaging, you can kind of see, you know, this row of words, it's actually vertical. So each vertical couplet is one of the core social values, and there's like 12 of those. Um, 
centralization. This one was particularly prominent in Shanghai. So as Steve said towards the beginning, um, the way districts interpreted national um, campaigns, they oftentimes had a great deal of freedom to design, to, to figure out how to express that in their own PSAs. And by the time we get to 2019, you'll notice the messaging that they're using or allowed to use, you know, however you want to interpret it, it becomes a lot more coordinated and it becomes a lot more noticeable in Shanghai for a particular reason. And I'll show you a few examples here. So this is in Xuhui district and you, you can see here, the theme here is about, you know, uh, caring for the healthy growth of miners. So in Huangpu district, you can see uh, they're a bit more explicit about this being more ideological and moral as well as, you know, physically making sure that they grow up. So um, here you can see in Jing'an district, this is a PSA telling residents to sort out the garbage. You, you know, and you can see something very similar in Changning as well. So the messages are very similar. You'll notice that the themes and the designs can be somewhat different. Um, partially because I believe, and we, we have some theories as to why this may be, but in 2019, designs get more complex, districts begin to differentiate themselves a lot more, especially in Shanghai, but the messages have become more closely coordinated. And uh, one last particular trend is the role of Xi Jinping in PSAs. So he actually does appear a lot more often than his predecessors did in similar ads from when they were um, in office. And so here you can actually see Xi Jinping's name is actually mentioned by name. It's actually in this first row here. It mentions Xi Jinping kind of in center part of the right column, which is actually the, what we would call the top row, right? That that's part you read first. But this is amazing in 2019. And another example, a particular prominent one in Shanghai that I know is because it was part of a series. So this is only one poster in the series. Uh, so um, but it mentions Xi Jinping thought here as well. And actually mentions the precursors to his thought that are officially in the party constitution. Um, Xi Jinping thought was added in 2017 in the 19th Congress, the previous one. They mentioned Marxism, Leninism. Uh, they mentioned Maoism and Deng Xiaoping's reforms. And a noticeable trend is that the two leaders who came after Deng Xiaoping, um, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, their ideologies, they are added into the constitution by tradition into the party ideology, but they don't traditionally feature their names. And so Xi Jinping is the first leader of China since Deng Xiaoping uh, to have his name specifically mentioned in his thoughts, you know, Xi Jinping uh, thought. So I forgot what the full name is, but yeah, Xi Jinping thought his name is actually mentioned by name. Right, and so this post, this PSA is just one of many that kind of explicitly mentioned that and um, centered him in a way. So, you know, before we uh, move on, uh, we'd just like to go ahead and thank everybody at uh, at the um, Digital Scholarship Services Fund Library, as well as, of course, the Star Foundation and the Luce Foundation, who have helped us um, funding for this project for I believe the whole time, right? Like that's right. the last two decades, yeah. and we'll. Uh, We'll definitely be uh, um, open to questions at the end of the presentation, but yeah. Great, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that uh, fascinating work. Uh, and finally, we have Dr. John Mulligan, who is the Humanities Computing Researcher Facilitator um, in OIT, and he will be you know, talking about pre preliminary notes on and anticipated opportunities for Rice's migration of uh, slave voyages to cloud infrastructure. So take it away, John. Thanks. Uh, so tell me when you can see the PowerPoint. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, fabulous. All right. Thanks, everybody. So um, I'm going to do this one inside out. I'm going to start from the tech and I'm going to slowly work my way out to the humanities. Okay. So um, about a year ago, uh, Dr. Daniel Dominguez de Silva, who is thankfully on the call, uh, told the Center for Research Computing that he was very much interested in bringing slave voyages to Rice. Uh, we approached uh, Oracle for research and we uh, wrote a small grant uh, to request some cloud credits to fund our development of a new deployment pipeline to the cloud. And what you're gonna see here today are uh, our preliminary results from that. We did take over the project from Emory University uh, last month. Here we go. All right, so this is the most boring but most wonderful part of the slave voyages.org interface. Um, and you can go there right now if you'd like. 
Um, what it shows you is this very long data table that has, I believe, 90 variables, and it allows you to search on this basic unit of a voyage. Um, it started with the transatlantic uh, voyages, um, mostly from European nations. Dr. Dominguez was instrumental in bringing in the Southern Atlantic voyages to uh, Brazil mostly. And then one of his colleagues brought in the, inter, uh, the intra-American uh, slave voyage data set, which brings us up to about 47,000 voyages. And the voyage is an interesting unit because what it does is, um, some people think that it can be a little too abstract, but what it allows for is to capture things like who owned the ship? Where did the ship stop? Where did it begin? How many people got on board the ship? Sometimes you even get the names of the people who were enslaved and transported, right? Um, you, can get, you can get some death statistics from these sorts of things as well. Uh, you can get dates, places. So um, although it is somewhat abstract and doesn't capture the full human element of it, it allows you to see across these many different variables that each capture a bit of a slice of the, uh, of the slave trade. So how does this thing work? It runs on its back end on a MySQL database that has 88 tables in it. About half of them are dedicated directly to the data that you interact with as a, uh, as a normal consumer on the website. Um, the, main data, uh, the main database table that I was referring to is Voyages, right, that it takes its name from. Uh, it has 11 main columns in it, and there are 47,000 rows, voyages, uh, in it. What you can see here is the different variables that are captured in that main table. And here's a sample of the data. Oh, I jumped forward. Uh, but you guys might have gotten your fill of these uh, SQL snapshots. From there, uh, a Python Django application as the back end uh, interprets the data, gets its hooks into it, and presents an API for the JavaScript front end to render those beautiful data tables. And if you do navigate to the site, which I please I do encourage you to do, uh, you will see that there are some very rich dynamic visualizations that are rendered live on the basis of these very fine grained advanced searches that you can run on the entire data set. And there are different verticals on the site that allow you to search different aspects of the slave trade that they've captured uh, data on thus far. Uh, so what you'll see here is, and the reason I'm capturing all of this is because I want you guys to see that like there, there, there is this transparency back to these numerical data points that really roll up a large uh, view on uh, this world historical uh, tragedy. And it allows you to search in a numerical basis, for instance, on years. So you can see very easily, once you drill down into it, as complex as the interface looks, if you, if you really abstract and think about what you're looking at here, you can see how searches are constructed. And this is important because of where we want to go with the site down the road, which is we want to make this data available to as many people as possible as we grow the site quickly and sustainably. Okay, so how do we do that? We move it to the cloud. So the database uh, was first published publicly in a CD-ROM and it uh, moved to a website in the late 2000s. It was recently deployed off of Emory's on-premises servers to AWS. This happened in 2020. And this was the deployment architecture that they used, where they had uh, basically scaled services inside of uh, code as infrastructure um, deployments that built these environments from scratch using scripts. Amazon is quite powerful at these things. They have all of these internal tools that allow you to do these sorts of things. Um, when we took a look at this, what we decided that we wanted to do was do something a bit more modular if we could. So what we uh, experimented with and what uh, Oracle for Research's uh, cloud credits gave us the uh, latitude to do, the room to work with, it allowed us to move all of this data into their systems and 
see what we could do with it. So the first thing we did was, I mean, it's Oracle. We decided, let's see, let's take their database tools uh, for a drive. So we imported all of this data into their autonomous transaction processing system, which is one of their more advanced cloud database systems. And some of the tools that you get right out of the box with that sort of thing are things like um, very complex entity relationship diagrams generated on the fly. So what we have here are all of those tables that I was showing you with callouts for foreign keys, like all of the different links between the tables. So you can actually see how in a global way that really wasn't possible before, all of these different researchers over the decades layered their data in and kept it highly structured in such a way that each of these different data sets that they brought from all of these different sources around the globe, primarily the Atlantic, uh, interacted with each other in order to paint this big picture that, you know, sometimes 1500 people at once were looking at. So what we did first was we deployed it in a uh, development setting using Docker. Basically, when we tried to do it on the uh, autonomous transaction processing uh, system, we found that the legacy nature of the SQL database, as well structured as it was, it was really locked down. It didn't allow for you to move it into a new system. Uh, there was a specifically, I don't know if anyone cares, but there was an interesting primary key handoff move that was handing in the that was handing on the Python layer, where uh, the wires got crossed, the uh, variables uh, didn't match up anymore, and this and Python couldn't interpret anymore. So we used a MySQL cloud deployment. Um, that Oracle had made available on its cloud infrastructure system. And what we did was we took the various parts of the application and we broke them out into services in Docker containers. We deployed them on different VMs. And what we were doing here was we were mirroring in a cloud environment, basically what one of the developers, the outside developer, uh, Domingos de la Monica out of Brazil, uh, what he was doing on his own local development platform. So he was building a Docker uh, environment that had these different containers in it that talked to each other to basically simulate the website. And we decided we were gonna copy that and bring it into production. So here's our first build of this uh, in development. Basically it smooths the path out from the developer side of things to the production environment. This is the advanced version of it. This is the production uh, deployment that is currently visible when you go to slavevoyages.org. So what you see is uh, basically, can you guys see my mouse? Is that, uh, I wish I had a laser pointer. So we have, a, uh, My we have a MySQL scalable service here, right? We have all those static assets. And this is important because you wanna offload all the big stuff if you can, so that the rebuild of the applications happens as quickly as possible. And so what you see is that when the developers build one of these things, it's a little bulky, but when they, uh, but when they ship it out, we just push our code to GitHub and then this build server over inside of a secure cloud network draws in the code every time it's updated on GitHub, rebuilds the images for the applications and then pushes them out to the application servers and then switches out the old containers for the new ones. So what you end up with is zero downtime and a very rapid republishing uh, pipeline so you can republish the site and as soon as you commit your changes, you can count on the site being fully updated as long as you're not changing the database structure within about 45 minutes, which is a change from uh, the uh, rather longer time that it was taking before to see changes. So why is that important? It's important because this site has been developed over a very long period of time. And so it has accumulated a lot of what we call technical debt, which is to say that for instance, it's written in Python 2.7, that has to change. In order to change that, we have to change a lot of code. And that means breaking things along the way. So we have to change all sorts of stuff in our development environment, push it into our test environment. And then once those are approved, move it over to our production environment. <laughs> Evening out all of the different environmental variables between those different systems is an absolute infrastructural nightmare without something like Docker that's keeping control over the environment that you're working in. So this site, we think its future is best guaranteed by having the ability for the researchers to propose and to see changes in the code 
realized on the test servers uh, within hours in order to identify problems and catch them before they go into production. Essentially, this site is a living, breathing publication, and it's crucial that the data is accurate and reliable, given the significance that it has for the study of history. So where can we go with it once we make this uh, application agile in the way that we have? After we pay off the technical debt, we think we can do a few things. First, there's the expansion of the quantitative data set. There will be an expansion that Dr. Dominguez has proposed uh, to look at the Indian Ocean. So obviously there was a slave trade on the Eastern coast of Africa as well. Dr. Dominguez has already done quite a lot of work. He, uh, here's a site that he already has. You can go and visit that one. Uh, it shows the uh, registers of people who were uh, liberated over a period of time in Mozambique. And he has a lot of very interesting data on where they came from, where they were enslaved, sometimes what their uh, ethnic groups were. And this allows, him to, uh, this allows him to show how these different groups are connected over time. However, as we grow that quantitative data set, it may become too large to host locally. And this points towards a larger structural problem. We think we may have to move to a fully hosted cloud database system that fronts an API out to people so that they can develop their applications locally without having to host containerized databases themselves to connect to. That's important. Uh, and it also would, uh, that's important because it would keep uh, too many uh, conflicts from emerging in the database and it would allow people to iterate the code faster. So we think that's ultimately the direction it would go. Unfortunately, then we have to start thinking about how we hand out keys, whether or not we can make this API available to everyone everywhere at any rate. Probably not, that would cost a lot. But once you move down that road, then you can start to think about, okay, if we have a fully hosted database, then perhaps we can start expanding out beyond data that people have sometimes criticized as being uh, too quantitative. There's been a lot of work, uh, for example, uh, in enslaved.org um, uh, to look at data that is not as readily quantified because what they want to do is rehumanize this history while also collecting it at scale. One of the things they've folded in, as you can see from the screenshot, is the Voyages data set. So they try to bring that in there. We think that the Voyages data set has the potential to grow out into the qualitative domain, uh, domain as well. Again, this will only be possible by having lightweight containerized apps. One of the platforms we're thinking of doing this with is with Omeka S, which, which could act as a large document store content management system. Uh, our friends at Oracle for Research have been, uh, have been prototyping one of these deployments up in their infrastructure. And what we're hoping to do is basically create an easy to use content management system that's built for the humanities to allow the researchers to take the sources because that is one of the columns uh, in the database that uh, references the primary sources that they got the data from and we can point directly to a PDF. So we can have linked data out to these documents even if it's copyrighted because we can have it behind a firewall in the cloud so that only the researchers can access it until they need to publish it for scholarly purposes. We've also been working with some React front ends to interact with the Omeka S API in order to visualize this data and make it interactive on a rich and editable basis. Finally, we think there are more directions that this can go in that really cross the boundaries between the qualitative and the quantitative. So this is an experiment that I ran using the ship owners table. What I did is I went up against the uh, Stanford uh, Kindred Network in Britain which has, uh, uh, which has a record of about 29,000 people in their database. We have about 15,000 named ship owners in our database. And the thing that these data points have in common is they have people names and they have dates that they're associated with. So I pulled down all of those names and I ran a fuzzy match on names and, uh, and the dates that we assumed they were alive. Then I found those matches. We found about 144 very good ones and then I walked out the social network from there. And what we ended up with is a, uh, a sort of devil's dictionary of the Stanford Kindred Network that could show 
how close certain historical figures were to known slave uh, people who profited from the slave trade by the ownership of ships. And we think that that sort of work, I mean, really at that point, you're pushing the boundaries where it, that's not really qualitative versus quantitative anymore. You're really moving into the possibility of analyzing social networks. And I think that would have uh, consequences for reparations, which is something that this group has been uh, very interested in before. So we're hoping that by containerizing this thing, making it more lightweight, making it more flexible, and by doing it in open source software, as enabled by the grant given to us by Oracle, we're going to be able to make this site sustainable, rapidly iteratable, available to more people for more visualizations and more interactivity, for the importation of more data, and then eventually, hopefully, for finding out more things that we didn't think were possible before. Thanks. Thanks so much, John. I'm afraid we're um, out of time and uh, Faraz had to um, leap off into another meeting. Um, and uh, see uh, Brandon and John, I assume you, you would be willing to stick around for a couple of minutes if people had uh, questions. Um, you got it. Okay, um, and, and uh, there's one uh, from Brian in the chat. Um, I noticed that women and women were present in the first two stages for Leong, but then dropped out how to interpret that and does the digital humanities component help us interpret that shift better? Would you have seen it at all without the visualizations? Uh, I think women and women, I, I included both terms because there are two different words in Chinese and I didn't want to lose one or the other. The fact that they dropped out just means that they were no longer the focus of Leong's writing in the second period of his life. Um, and I, what I forgot to say is that when once these co-occurrence networks uh, appear, then I go back to the text and I read 150 characters before that occurrence, 150 characters behind after that occurrence, make sure that any kind of nuanced uh, meaning is not misinterpreted. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, and feel free to unmute yourself or ask them in the chat. I have a question to uh, Dr. Chow as well. Uh, I was wondering if, um, if you're gonna expand uh, the project to include other Chinese intellectuals, writers, politicians? Hi, Daniel, that's a great question. Uh, yes, this guy, um, the, the founder of the Communist Party is the subject of my dissertation. So he is my main focus, but because he's in, he has a cohort of other intellectuals during those years from 1915 to 1920, who were instrumental in changing the minds of the young students they had in Beijing University, it's, it would be fascinating to see if they copied each other's language. And in a way, in this exercise, I've already seen that the Communist Party founded a younger guy, did use a lot of language from his mentor, Mr. Liang, who's six years older. And so then it'd be fun to see the horizontal influence of each other. Um, but I need to get my book out first. So that's the first project. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, great. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I know people have places to go, so I really appreciate you being here for this um, showcase. Uh, thanks especially to our panelists for sharing their exciting work. Uh, and there will be a recording available pretty soon uh, so if you'd like to check this out again. I also put in the chat um, a link to the uh, Rice Digital Humanities website, which continues to be developed. And feel free to get in touch with me. I'm putting my email address in the chat. Uh, if you have questions or ideas, we really want to try to build a digital humanities community here at Rice. So thanks so much to our speakers and thank you all for attending.